welcome to Wesley Church. We're so glad that you're here with us today in this season of Advent. We have a special service prepared for you. My name is Megan, and I get the privilege of serving as a pastor here at Wesley. And so join with us in worship this day and all throughout the season of Advent. There's a lot going on, so take a look at this. Good morning and welcome to Wesley Church. My name is Elise and we're happy that you're here with us this morning for our second Sunday of Advent and our series, A Season Beyond Expectations. Each Advent season, we pick different nonprofit organizations to support through our Advent mission giving. In the past several weeks, we've been collecting toys for the Crosslines Toy Drive, and we're so excited to be able to make it a joyful Christmas for kids in our community, thanks to you and your generous donations. Over the coming weeks, we will share more about other partners, such as Ozark's Food Harvest, which is the food bank for Southwest Missouri, serving over 28 counties, the Rainbow Network, and our goal of completing our Homes for Pancorva goal, and the Wesley Care Fund. If you would like to support one of these, or maybe all of these projects, visit our website, wesleymethodist.com give to learn how. This week, both of our Advent studies started through our Facebook page. It's never too late to join. The videos stay on the page so you can rewatch or catch up anytime. For questions, call the church office, office or visit our website. And if you're like me, your home is starting to look a little bit more like Christmas each day. And while it might not be the Christmas that we had hoped for this year, I am excited to share with you our plans as a church to celebrate together. For more information, check out this video from Pastor Mike. Friends, I love this time of the year. I mean, I really love Christmas. I wholeheartedly agree with Andy Williams that it's the most wonderful time of the year. And one of the things that I like best about this time of the year is the music. Hearing the glorious music of the season makes Christmas real to me. It brings back memories of a kinder, gentler time when everything just seemed right with the world. You know, there's never been a year when the words of the song, we need a little Christmas right this very minute, rang more true. So here at Wesley, we're going to be celebrating a good old-fashioned Norman Rockwell Courier and Ives kind of Christmas. We're going to be reminded that it might be 2020. We might be in the midst of a terrible pandemic. We might not be able to get together with those we love, but it's still Christmas. And there's nothing that can diminish the joy that comes to us in the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, I'm excited to invite you to celebrate the birth of Jesus on Christmas Eve at Wesley this year. We have shared a few updates about our plans for Christmas Eve online, and while it's not going to be the kind of Christmas we all had envisioned, I promise you that we're doing our very best to bring the joy of a Wesley Christmas to you at home. From the Advent wreath kits to the beautifully decorated spaces for online worship and Advent studies and devotionals, we want you to know we're here with you and praying alongside you this holy season of love. On Christmas Eve, we will start the celebration with our children's and family service at 5 p.m. This will be led by Mr. Andy and will feature interactive stories and songs for all ages. At 6 p.m., 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 10 p.m., and 11 p.m., we will celebrate our traditional Christmas Eve candlelight services in the sanctuary. And our 9 p.m. service will be live streamed from the beautifully decorated gym, and this will be a worship experience filled with beloved Christmas carols for the whole family to sing along. And as a reminder, these services will premiere online through our Facebook page and YouTube channel and can be viewed on demand after each premieres at their specific time. We will also make sure to send out an email with direct links to our pages the week of Christmas Eve. So make sure to subscribe to our email list if you haven't already. 
The pandemic obviously has made our Christmas worship more challenging this year, but again, we are confident that it cannot diminish the joy of the celebration of our Savior's birth. We pray that you will have a very safe and a very Merry Christmas. And we look forward to celebrating the birth of Jesus with you. Thank you for tuning in to this week's Wesley Word. Stay up to date with all things Wesley Church by visiting our website and following our social media pages. Let us come together and worship. Last week we lit the candle of hope because the coming of the Messiah is the one true hope of the world. And today we light the candle of love because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In the book of Isaiah, we read, The Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will be with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. Please join with me in prayer. God of hope and Lord of love, your goodness is beyond our wildest imaginings. You give us more than we can think to ask, coming to us with impossible possibility in the union of flesh and spirit. Teach us to love this world and all people as you love us in Jesus Christ our Lord, God of hope, God of love, come into our darkness and save us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Please join us in singing hymn number 220, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Oh, Lord. 
Friends, can you please join with me in prayer? God of Christmas and God of love, we come together today to give you praise and thanks for the fact that Christmas proves to us how deeply and how completely you are committed to us, how deeply and beautifully you love us. Because we chose to sin, we chose to walk out on you. We chose to be separated from you. You never left us. We left you. But your love is so strong that it it compelled you to bridge that separation, to, to bridge the gap that we caused with our sin to be able to once again be with us, to be able to once again restore to us the relationship that gives us life, the relationship that makes us whole. And so for the gift of Christmas, for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Emmanuel, for the gift of God with us, we just want to give you our praise and thanks. And Lord, we, we are so very aware of so many people during this time of the pandemic who feel very separated, very isolated, very lonely. There are so many factors in our world today to bring about division. Division caused by by hate, division caused by hurt, division caused by politics, division caused by sin. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit will will come upon these broken relationships and bring about healing, bring about true love and unity. But Lord, there's also people who are are separated not through evil, not through, through sin, not through choice, but they are separated through sickness. They are separated because of the pandemic. They are separated from the ones they love, from the ones that that seek to give them comfort. And so their loneliness is acute. And and Lord, if if we're going to be honest, we have to admit sometimes during this, this dark pandemic, we feel separated from you. And so crash through our darkness, Lord. Crash through our hurt as you did 2,000 years ago, as you've been doing for 2,000 years ago, and come to us, O great Emmanuel, and restore to us the light and the love that is a relationship with you, that is a wholeness with you. Because, Lord, we all carry around inside of us that longing, and so many of us don't know what we're longing for. So come to us that we can have that longing fulfilled because we know, Lord, those who follow you, we know that what we are all longing for is that unity with you. So take away our sins, take away our hurt, dispel the darkness. And O come, O come, Emmanuel, to us to save us, and to love us. And now hear us, Lord God, as together we lift up to you the prayer that Jesus taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Christmas carol tells us that deck the halls with boughs of holly Tis the season to be jolly. But we all know this Christmas is going to be different, just like Thanksgiving was different. 
Now, we've had some Christmas lights that have gone up early just because we needed a lot of a little holly and jolly. We don't even seem as upset this year that the, the stores jump to holiday decorations because we need an early Christmas this year. We can't shop like normal. We can't gather like normal. We can't worship in our beautiful sanctuary as normal. Most of us feel the, the somberness of this pandemic, especially as we hear stories, heartbreaking stories of not enough ventilators and of death. We know that businesses and families are struggling economically. And we know this is true all over the world. So it only makes sense to turn to the record of the deepest human agony found in the pages of the Bible, the book of Job. What happens to Job is one of the most agonizing records of history. And when I say history, I mean deep history. This story happened long, long ago. Now, Job didn't celebrate Christmas, but he wanted Christmas. And he wanted it desperately. Now, I can say that, but at the same time, it's not true because Job didn't know that it was Christmas that he wanted. But he was definitely yearning for an early Christmas. Job was said to be one of the greatest people of all the people of the East. Not much de detail is given to us about Job, but we know that he had this greatness. Now his greatness, though, wasn't just about his wealth and his community standing. No, above all, he was truly a fine human being. Someone of whom God would say, there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. In those days, it was widely believed that God, if you were good, God would bless you. And conversely, if things went wrong for you, it was evident that you were not good. We actually still hear quite a bit of this thinking today. It is behind the question of why do bad things happen to good people? Or when somebody has some good news, a friend might jokingly say, well, you must be doing something right. Now, being such a good man, Job did seem to live a very charmed life. And so as the book begins, we have a little behind-the-scenes look at what's going on. Satan asked God if he can tempt Job, this most faithful, devout man. Satan had, was convinced that Job only followed the Lord because of his wealth and health and all of his blessings. And so, on a single day, Satan caused tragedy to strike in this man's life. All the wealth and possessions he had were swept away as disaster after disaster hit him. His herds and flocks were stolen or killed. His houses ruined and demolished. And then above all else, all of his children, seven sons and three daughters, were killed in that one day. What a tragic day it must have been. But this was not all. Satan went back to God and asked permission to afflict Job personally, physically. And so there came upon Job terrible boils, running sores, which persisted week after week after week. If you've ever had a painful boil or carbuncle, you know how terribly painful that is. Here was a man who had them from head to toe. So we read that Job took refuge on an ash heap. Apparently all that was left of his once great fortune. And there he was visited by a small group of friends. We refer to them sarcastically as Job's comforters. Because once they began talking, they did nothing to comfort. Rather, they ad added indignity to Job's constant pain. 
So Job sat in the ash heap and bemoaned his fate, felt abandoned by his friends. Even Job's wife finally reached the end of her endurance and patience. She turned from supporting him in his agony and reproached him. He told, she told him to, to curse God and die. So there Job sat on the ash heap alone, befalling, bemoaning this terrible lot that had fallen upon him. He saw no reason for it. He saw no explanation for it in his life. And so in his agony and suffering, feeling himself so unjustly treated, he cries out in agony to God. From Job 9, verses 25 through 33. My days are swifter than a runner. They fly away without a glimpse of joy. They skim past like boats of papyrus, like eagles swooping down on their prey. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will change my expression and smile. I still dread all my sufferings, for I know you will not hold me innocent. Since I am already found guilty, why should I struggle in vain? Even if I wash myself with soap and my hands with cleansing powder, you would plunge me into a slime pit so that even my clothes would detest me. He is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If there only were someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together. And then to make matters worse, these free fr three friends are there to comfort him. And they say nothing for a week, which was the wise thing to do. But then they started talking. And they don't really stop for a long time. And their argument is just in one direction, that the suffering such as this can only result from hidden sin. And so they were convinced that Job was covering something up. This unjust accusation is simply wiped out Job's spirit. And so he cries out finally for his friends to simply leave him alone and at least have the, the grace to, to leave him be in his sufferings. But as you may have sensed in our scripture, the worst thing of all to Job is this feeling that he cannot reach God with his cries, and that even if he could, the greatness of God would so overwhelm him that he would not be able to cry out. And so this causes him a great sense of frustration. And so listen to the last two verses again with me. The he that is referred to in this scripture is Job, or is God. God is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If there is only someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together. Job sensed rightly that the distance between his state and God's was profound that there was no direct connection to God, even though he was a man of prayer and holiness. And I suspect that his present state of loss added to this sense of unworthiness before God. You know, it's hard to think well of yourself when you're sitting on an ash heap, scratching at your boils. Job's response is a pretty hopeless one. It's understandable. But what he calls for is a special kind of mediator, someone with enough standing before God to lay a hand on God, and yet understanding enough of the human condition to lay a hand on Job. You see, Job was appealing for Christmas, the event that gives us the one described in the Apostles' Creed as conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of Virgin Mary. Someone that is able to lay a hand on God and on us because he is God and he has an understanding of humanity because he is human. When Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem of Judea, the shepherds were told that he would be born as a baby 
a man, a human being like us, related to us, and that he would share in our anguish, he would share our pain, our sense of frustration, and he would understand it. And when he came, he came into a world like ours today. Sherwood writ captured the mood of that first Christmas in this description. He's describing the culture and, and the political mood at the time. And he says, the people of the time of Jesus' birth were being heavily taxed and faced every prospect of a sharp increase to cover expanding military expenses. The threat of world domination by a cruel, ungodly, power-intoxicated band of men was ever just below the threshold of consciousness. Moral deterioration had corrupted the upper levels of society and was moving rapidly into the broad base of the populace. There was intense nationalistic feelings that were clashing openly with new and sinister forms of imperialism. Conformity was the spirit of the age. Government handouts were being used with increasing lavishness to keep the population from rising up and throwing out the leaders. Interest rates were spiraling upward in the midst of an inflated economy. External religious observances were just considered a political asset. But there was an abnormal emphasis being put on sports and athletic competition. Rac racial tensions were at the breaking point. And in such a time, and amid such a people, a child was born to migrant, a migrant couple who had just signed up for a fresh round of taxation and who were soon to become political exiles. And the child who was born to them was called Emmanuel, God with us. We can resonate with some of the descriptions of the world at the time of Jesus' birth. Our world looks quite similar. But what Job, long, long before, was permitted to see and the gloom and the despair of his heart was that the, what was the solution to the problems of human agony. Whatever they may be, the solution was one who can stand and both touch God and touch us. You know, at the end of the book of Job, God does meet with Job, and he doesn't answer all of Job's questions, but he resolves the conflict in Job's heart. And the story of Job ends on a happy note. It's almost like a good movie. Now, here at Wesley, some of our staff are really into Christmas movies, and they have very definite ideas of which ones are the best and which ones should just be tossed aside. You hear everything from It's a Wonderful Life to A Charlie Brown, Brown Christmas to Elf to The Grinch to A Christmas Story and beyond. Now, while these are all great stories, they are not the story. You know, because in the midst of all these modern Christmas stories, we have the original story as Christians. And unpacking that original story takes more than a two-hour movie. Job cries out, If only there was someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together. This is what the message of Christmas ultimately is to us. Jesus, the one who shares life with us, with its ache, its agony, its pain, its betrayal, and its heartache, that one is born. All that makes up the suffering of 2020 is understood and is entered into as God and humanity. The world in which he was born was a gloomy, dark, hopeless world where people lived in misery and fear and loneliness by and large. Jesus brings us together with God. We may not be able to be together as a church family 
or in large family gatherings, but Jesus is with us incarnate in the flesh. Jesus is that someone who can bring us together. In the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, he was transformed from a grumpy, hard-hearted miser to a generous and loving man. In a lot of the Christmas stories, the main character often goes through some, some sort of transformation. George Bailey finds hope again. The Grinch's heart grows three sizes. Charlie Brown learns what Christmas is all about. And the list could go on. And when you think about it, as much as these are Christmas, Christmas stories, they also could be Advent stories. Because Advent is all about getting ready. Advent is all about our own transformation. It's about preparing our hearts for someone who is coming and about opening up it up to new ways of being. Now Mary had a head start she knew that that one was coming, one who would touch us with the hand of God. And so look at how Mary responded to the unexpected and confusing news that she was pregnant. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God. Now, magnify is an odd term in this context, but I like to think of it as this. To magnify God is to live your life in a way that makes God's love for the world even bigger and even more obvious to the people who surround us. And in a real sense, to choose to magnify God, especially in times when we are asked to respond to a new challenge or a new reality in our lives, has a lot to do with how we love and if anyone could understand what it means to respond to God in the midst of the unexpected, it was Mary. She is faced with the end of life as she knew it. And she responds by saying she is going to rejoice and make God's love known to the world. Mary was the first person who was asked to respond to the Christmas story, but she wasn't the last. Because though we are called to participate in the Christmas story in a very different way than Mary was, we are invited into this story nonetheless. That's because at Christmas time, if we are going to be part of the Christmas story, we are called to make the hard choice to love. You know, and I don't use that phrase, hard choice, lightly. I use it because loving this world and loving one another requires something of us. It requires us to invest in others. It requires us to give of ourselves. And most of all, love requires us to be willing to be changed. Even Christmas movies know this. Scrooge realizes the error of his ways and his heart is transformed and only then does he give generously. Charlie Brown finds meaning in his sad little Christmas tree, despite the fact that the whole world has gone commercial and no one understands what Christmas is really all about. And if you've seen one of my least favorites, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, in the end we know that Clark Griswold, who just wants a perfect Christmas, finds, despite the fact that everything has gone the wrong way, he finds the love of his family. If we're really serious about Advent, if we're really serious about preparing our hearts for the coming of Christ, if we are truly using this season to focus on what is coming, there is no way that we won't be changed by it. Maybe we won't have a big, miraculous, carol-filled Christmas Eve and Christmas morning. But inside our hearts, if you listen closely, you'll hear the change happening and the love filling us and the hand of God upon us. And as powerful as that love is within us, it's even more powerful when we share it. When the, in the face of all the troubles that are in the world, we show the world what God's love truly is. What if we showed how powerful God's love can be? 
Jesus, Job was crying out for Christmas. One who could be a mediator between himself and God. We cry out for Christmas in a time like no other in the midst of our lifetimes. Christ still comes into this world. Christmas is still going to happen. It didn't just happen once. It happens all the time. Because Christmas may be about the story that we read. It may be about Mary and Joseph and the baby and the manger and no room at the end. But it's not the end of the story. The great Christmas story continues to play out. And the truly incredible thing is that you and I are invited to move onto the stage and get to be a part of the story and even choose our own lines. And so as we prepare for Christmas, here's the big question. What is your script going to say? My hope is that your script is going to be full of the words and actions of one who wants to magnify God and to live out Christmas. My hope is that it will be one of a person who has been transformed by the love of God and who now wants to love the world because of God. The Grinch, Scrooge, Charlie Brown, George Bailey, and all the rest, those are really great stories. But so is yours. And this Christmas, if you really open your hearts to the love of Christ this year, then your story is about to get really good. I can't wait to hear it. And neither can a world that could use some good stories right about now. And that could use a touch from Emmanuel. One that will bring us together. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join us now in singing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. It's number 196. Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, born to save thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee Israel's strength and consolation hope of all the earth it is Friends, Christmas proves to us how much God loves us because at Christmas God put flesh and blood on that love and came to us in order to redeem, in order to save. So let us give praise and thanks for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Emmanuel. And now, my friends, go in peace knowing that you are loved. And that Christmas is God's song of love to you. 
In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.